Thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind um, introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Is the sound, can everyone hear me all right? OK, fantastic. Um, before I begin, in addition to thanking you for the invitation, I want to say I've had just a fantastic time with meeting with uh, many of you one on one. It, uh, I'm deeply impressed by all of your research. It is incredibly refreshing to step back from one's own research and hear about uh, what other people are doing and to return to one's work with sort of a new perspective. So thank you all for taking the time to meet with me. Um, so my name is Steve Doris. I'm at the Center for Reproductive Evolution at Syracuse University. And today I'm going to be talking about the molecular life, uh, molecular life history of sperm with a focus on the importance of understanding postcopulatory male by female interactions. So it was in 1951 that Austin and Chang independently demonstrated that sperm must spend a minimum amount of time in the female reproductive tract to achieve fertilization capacity. This process, it's, which is referred to as capacitation, includes a kind of a very carefully orchestrated set of events, which involves the modification of the sperm membrane, increases in cyclic AMP and intracellular calcium, induction of a complex set of phosphorylation cascades, which ultimately results in hyperactive motility and the acrosome reaction. Those are really revolutionary observations. They represent the first sort of unequivocal demonstration of the importance of sperm by female reproductive tract interactions for reproductive success. Despite extensive investigations for 70 years, and obviously investigations that are hugely important with regard to human infertility and therefore have been very intensive and well-funded, our understanding of sperm capacitation is still heavily reliant on in vitro studies. And if there's one take home message that I wanna get across to you today, it's that studying sperm biology in vivo in the complex selective environment of the female reproductive tract is complicated. Um, Idiopathic infertility in humans is very common. Some of you may be aware of that. The etiological basis of idiopathic of infertility is unre unresolved in a substantial number of individuals who uh, undergo diagnostic evaluation. So despite sort of uh, the kind of remarkable advances in diagnostic technologies that are available in IVF clinical settings in the field of andrology, there is now sort of a widespread consensus that idiopathic infertility is likely to be due to breakdowns or dysregulation in male by female reproductive interactions. So what I'm gonna tell you about uh, today in one part of the talk is that capacitation is just one example of what we refer to as post ejaculatory modifications of sperm or PEMS. I'm gonna tell you a bit about a, uh, a review that I published with Mariana Wolfner, who was just mentioned, and Scott Pitnick, which demonstrates that PEMS, post-ejaculatory modification of sperm, are in fact widespread, if not ubiquitous across the animal kingdom. And so ultimately, the other big take-home messages from today is that integrated approaches that involve both sexes are essential to understanding post-copulatory mechanisms underlying fertilization. Okay. So really, it was about seven or eight years ago that we sat down and wrote a review about all of the sort of different potential classes of post-copulatory molecular interactions. In the context of this review, we were thinking specifically about post-mating reproductive isolation. And this is a busy slide. I don't know how well you can see each of these categories. But the point here is that there are lots of molecular and cellular interactions that occur within the female reproductive tract. But oftentimes, we don't know what the molecular players are. And so, especially of relevance to this audience, is that the integrated approaches, which involve both sexes that I just mentioned, are really, understand, really important for understanding the evolution of postcopulatory mechanisms that ultimately contribute to reproductive isolation and speciation. OK, a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to give a quick background to sort of the field of sexual selection, a little bit of background history for the audience. Then we're going to move to a discussion of post-ejaculatory modification of sperm. Then we're going to talk about post-copulatory female reproductive tract dynamics and gene expression studies. We're going to talk, talk about the molecular life history of sperm. And then to conclude, I'm really going to talk about ongoing projects and the culmination of a long-term sort of phenomics project where we're trying to link microevolutionary processes to macroevolutionary patterns. 
Okay. Origin of sexual selection theory. Perhaps this background information isn't necessary for this audience, but as many of you may know that the origin of sexual selection theory and the term sexual selection can be traced back to Darwin. It was first used in his publication on the origin of species, although it was quite a brief mention in this context. In 1871, in his subsequent publication, he elaborates much further on concepts of selection in relation to sex. There are sort of two general distinct arenas where sexual selection operates. Perhaps one that you're more familiar with is pre-copulatory sexual selection, where you have intrasexual competition, which is usually male-male competition, but not always, and intersexual choice, which is usually in the form of female mate choice. In 1970, the field really went, underwent a revolution with Jeff Park's papers on sperm competition, and that led to the realization that sexual selection did not end with mating, but in fact continued in the form of post-copulatory sexual selection, which can kind of sort of be broken down into two parts, sperm competition and cryptic female choice, whereby females may be able to assess, evaluate, and bias utilization of sperm. So to summarize, what do we know about the rapidly diversifying uh, post-copulatory post phenomics that we presume are due to sexual selection forces? Well, first of all, we know that sperm are amongst the most rapidly evolving cell types. This is just a diagram here that's showing the kind of incredible morphological diversification which has been documented in sperm across the animal kingdom. We know that sperm production is highly responsive to selection. And so what I'm showing you here is primates with divergent mating systems, which is associated with different levels of promiscuity, which in turn is related with differential levels of predicted post-copulatory sexual selection, which has an impact on the evolution of testes size and spermatogenic capacity. We also know that female reproductive morphology and physiology is evolving rapidly. In this case, what I'm showing you is sperm storage organs in Drosophila. And we know that sperm storage organ morphology co-diversifies, co-evolves with sperm-like morphology across Drosophila. And that's something I'll touch on, touch on again later. And of course, as I just said, we know that in some cases that male by female post-copulatory traits co-diversify. So sperm length, sperm morphology, and sperm storage organs co-diversify in some cases, and we also know that there are aspects of, of male and female gametes that co-diversify. So since I started doing research in the field of sort of reproductive genetics, one of the things that really has um, fascinated me is the question of whether we can kind of link up phenotypic divergence in reproductive systems with underlying changes at the molecular level, at the genomic level. And I think you can say that we've had some success as a field over the last 20 years. And I'm gonna right now summarize advances on the evolution of reproductive genetics over the last 20, 20 years or so into just a couple of statements. So what is the genomic landscape of sexual selection? Well, we know that male reproductive genes on average tend to evolve rapidly. We know that some female reproductive genes tend to evolve rapidly, although there's been less focus on characterizing the complexities of the female reproductive system. And there's sort of been a general bias in the field for good reason to focus on oogenesis and oocytes and a little bit less known about the underlying genetic architecture of other aspects of the female reproductive tract. We have an extremely limited understanding, however, of the process of co-diversification between male and female reproductive genes. And this sort of can be explained by two different things. First of all, very few people do integrated studies of the sort of male and female interactions that I was referring to earlier. And as a whole, the field has generally been historically focused on the study of male reproductive genetic architecture. In part, that has to do with the fact that Testes gene expression patterns were characterized very early on, and when people saw examples of rapidly evolving testes-specific genes that really generated a sort of a positive feedback loop of people looking for more of those types of genes. So there's been sort of a historical bias in the field towards studying male reproductive gene evolution. And that's certainly the case for my own research so that I've been very interested in spermatogenesis and trying to understand if we can correlate patterns of evolution 
for genes that are involved in male reproduction with levels of predicted levels of postcopulatory sexual selection. So this is just showing you here an image of the Drosophila testes. Spermatogenesis is obviously a very complex process and with single cell RNA-seq, we now have a really refined idea of the sort of spatiotemporal patterns of gene expression during spermatogenesis. Historically, as the field of evolutionary genetics embraced first microarray technology and then RNA-seq technology, I sort of went in a different direction and I got very interested in applying proteomic analyses to the characterization of sperm and seminal fluid proteins, which are the non-spermatozole proteins that are found in the ejaculate. This is just showing you here a very simple sort of, uh, sort of way of depicting the complexity of a given proteome. So these are two-dimensional gel analyses. At the top, you're seeing a whole male. Then you're seeing the male reproductive tract as a whole, the seminal vesicle and sperm. And you can see, not unsurprisingly, sperm being a fairly streamlined cell type, you can see that it has a fairly reduced protein complexity and one that even going back 15 years could be investigated and explored with a fairly high level of accuracy and coverage using mass spec based proteomic techniques. So I'm not going to talk a lot about mass spectrometry or the proteomic techniques that we use, but I just want to give you a brief overview of why it's useful for studying cellular composition. So I should first say, regardless of what organism or model species you're focusing on, sperm are in many ways very tractable with regard to proteomic characterization, the first reason being that they're easy to purify in large quantities. It's also true that studying the sort of underlying molecular composition of sperm really needs to be approached using a proteomic technique because sperm are, for the most, uh, most part, transcriptionally silent. So one can purify these cell types in fairly large quantities. To ensure that you have high coverage, you can further reduce complexity by separating solubilized proteins using one-dimensional gel fractionation. You can then subject those fractions to mass spec, hand to mass spec, to generate spectra. And then this is just to give you an idea of what kind of data. Many people, even those of you who do RNA-seq experiments, may not be exactly sure how you can work with proteomic data. But in a way that's very analogous to RNA-seq data, you could use those spectra to identify what proteins to robustly and accurately identify what proteins are present in a given sample. That is to say, you can find the constituents uh, within the proteome, what proteins are there. And also there's a, ver a variety of alternative ways to do quantitation, but much like RNA-seq, analogous to RNA-seq, you can also get estimates of protein abundance levels, which then you can analyze using hierarchical clustering or principal component analyses or differential expression type statistical approaches. Okay, so we've done a lot of comparative quote unquote reproductive omics over the course of my career. I've had the pleasure to collaborate with lots of different people and work on a lot on, to work on a number of different study sections. We've worked in Drosophila. We've worked in various mammalian taxa, including mammals and primates several ongoing collaborations with people who are interested in avian reproduction. We've had the good fortune of working on Lepidopteran taxa and beetles. But throughout the vast majority of this work until about seven or eight years ago, the focus was almost entirely on male reproductive genomics and omics. Very, uh, uh, I would say, good advances with regard to understanding the evolutionary diversification of the male reproductive side of the equation. And we do know, in fact, and have characterized what diversifies more rapidly relative to other aspects of the underlying genetic architecture. But where we've really failed is to contextualize this within the female side of the equation, that which is oftentimes responsible for generating the selective forces. So in studying sperm biology, really the take home message here is you need to do it in an integrative fashion where you're actually thinking about it in the context of the female reproductive tract microenvironment, which is really the selective environment where sperm spend their molecular life history. Okay, post ejaculatory modifications to sperm. So this is a, a sort of a summary of a biological reviews paper that we published in 2020 with Scott Pitnick, who's at Syracuse University, a colleague of mine and Mariana Wolfner, who you know, this had to do with basically going and really just doing a comprehensive review of the literature to find descriptive examples where people had looked at post-ejaculatory modification of sperm. 
Sperm are really a unique cell type. That is to say that they are cast forth from the soma of the individual in which they develop to spend the majority of their life history in a quote unquote foreign environment. So the free living portion of sperm's life takes place in the FRT. And it may be of surprise to some of you that this can be for a very prolonged period of time. We have a lot of Drosophila biologists in the room, so you're very aware that in Drosophila that sperm storage can last days, even longer, a week, maybe longer than that. But in some species, sperm storage can be quite prolonged. It can last for months or even years. And so this sort of selective environment is really critical to understanding sperm functionality during the sort of free living period of its life history. Capacitation, mammalian capacitation, as, as, as it's known, is only one example of post-ejaculatory modification of sperm. They are, in fact, widespread throughout the animal kingdom. And although PEMS are west, less well studied in non-mammalian taxa, I'm going to give you some examples here that hopefully convince you that, in fact, they're quite widespread and likely to be the rule rather than the exception. Now, I have to say that this review that we published really uh, leverages and, and uh, leverages very heavily on descriptive characterization of PEMS. Many of these sorts of phenomena have not been studied experimentally, but where they have been studied, it seems like PEMS are most likely to be critical for various as uh, uh, aspects of sperm functionality. That is to say they're important for sperm migration through the female reproductive tract, survival for this protected, protected period of storage, both and also in terms of spatial temporal migration and the capacity to fertilize eggs. So let me give you just a couple example of PEMS. The first one here has to do with primary sperm conjugation, which is found in many beetles. This is ongoing work by Tonio Gomez, who's a postdoc in our research group, along with Yasser Ahmed Brema. So primary sperm conjugation in beetles involves spermatogenesis, where sperm are actually attached to a rod-like structure, which we believe to be largely made out of proteins. And so they form what is called a primary conjugate. The product of spermatogenesis is a large number of sperm, although it varies tremendously across different beetle species, where sperm are attached to the rod-like structure, which is referred to as a spermatostyle, and they're transferred into females on that rod. After transfer to the females, there appears to be a highly regulated process by which sperm are removed from the spermatostyle and then ultimately are available for participating in fertilization. So we're using a combination of proteomics to characterize what spermatostyles are made of. This is being done in all species of beetles where we don't have genomic resources. So we also, in order to do all the proteomic analyses, need to do de novo transcriptomes. So it's quite an effort of uh, you know, inroads into studying non-model beetle systems. This is just one example of a post-ejaculatory modification of sperm. We do not know almost certain that this entire process is highly regulated and it's important for fertility, do not know exactly what role females play with regard to sperm removal from the spermatostyle structure. This is another example, sort of in a good example of potentially sort of convergent evolution. Here on the top, you have sperm from tunicates on the bottom, octopus in both cases when, fem when, when sperm are in the female reproductive tract, you have this dr dramatic remodeling of the sperm cell membrane, which reveals this cork-like uh, sperm head morphology. Again, we do not know the adaptive significance of this. In the case of the octopus, these sperm do in fact become embedded within the epithelium of the female reproductive tract. And so one might presume that the cork-like structure has something to do with them ensuring the correct sort of spatial location. But again, none of this has been, has been tested experimentally. This is a good example that sort of highlights sperm changes over a prolonged period of storage. This is in a species of turtle. The point here is simply you can see the morphological changes. This is over several months of sperm storage in the oviduct. Again, we know very little about what the functional significance of this might be, but you can see here you have sperm being stored in the oviduct over several months and these structures reducing in size. Do not know whether this contributes to sperm energetics or motility. We do not know to what extent females may play a role in these changes, but nonetheless, it points out or at least highlights the fact that sperm are spending a prolonged period of time within the female reproductive tract and that that must be sort of the critical selective environment in which, for, in which they need to function. 
So what might some of the adaptive significance, what might the adaptive significance of PEMS be? And these are certainly non-mutually exclusive hypotheses. They may contribute to economy of transfer. They may be involved in protecting sperm from stress. They may facilitate storage. They may enhance longevity. They may be involved in specifically delivering male cargo metabolites or other types of molecules to the female. And they also may contribute to aspects of female assessment of sperm quality and perhaps tell us something about underlying mechanisms of cryptic female choice. Important to remember, and this is going back to my initial introduction to this idea of sperm having a reduced um, proteome complexity, that sperm are, generally speaking, highly streamlined cells. They're highly specialized. And that their survival in the female reproductive tract may depend on female support and protection. I want to highlight two other examples here. Social insects are a great example of the potential importance of PEMS. We know that, for example, in bees work by Boris Bear's group, have shown that female secretions in the female reproductive tract are critical to sperm longevity and quality. So that's a great example where females are, in fact, providing an environment where sperm can, can have prolonged longevity and functionality. I want to highlight ants, and this is sort of a, a model system. We're looking for a great model system that we can work with within our research group. Ants perhaps have the most extreme sperm storage that we know of. In ants, queens oftentimes only mate one time. They're going to be storing large quantities of sperm that are going to be the basis for the production of their entire colony, and this can last for many years, up to a decade. Queens oftentimes in some species live for a decade. So obviously, there must be some highly co-evolved interactions going on that allow for sperm to maintain their viability and fertilization capacity over long periods of time. So meeting the physiological requirements of sperm over these prolonged period of time, we've sort of come to the conclusion that this must involve sort of some sort of co-evolved molecular handoff from males to females. And also, that this handoff may involve what we refer to as molecular continuity between the male and the female reproductive tract. When sperm need to survive over a long period of time, it may be that there's an evolutionary process whereby females are in fact picking up where the male process of spermatogenesis has left off, either topping up or replacing proteins or metabolites or other types of energetic substrates that sperm need during these prolonged periods of storage. Okay. We're going to move on to discussing postcopulatory female reproductive tract dynamics. And here we're going to remove, we're going to go back to Drosophila, talking about Drosophila and why Drosophila might be an ideal model uh, for studying reproductive postcopulatory interactions. This work, largely motivated, entirely conducted by Caitlin McDonough Goldstein. Some of you may know her. She's now a postdoc at University of Vienna. So what I'm going to be talking about in this section is entirely Caitlin's work. When she came to the lab, she was extremely excited to really make advances in understanding gene regulation in the female reproductive tract. And she was incredibly productive as a grad student in our group. And in many ways, as you're going to see, really laid the foundation for allowing us to begin to understand the molecular life history of sperm because there's really a surprising lack of information about gene and protein regulation in the female reproductive tract until C Caitlin uh, really tackled this issue. So why might Drosophila be an ideal model for studying postcopulatory interactions above and beyond the fact that melanic ester is a model organism? Well, we obviously know because of our own contributions and the contributions of other in the field, we know quite a lot about the proteins that make up an ejaculate and that are transferred to the female reproductive tract during mating. We also know a tremendous, about, tremendous amount about sperm migration and storage. This has been studied extensively. Also, my colleagues at Syracuse University, Scott Pitnick and John Belote, also were the first people to engineer these GFP and RFP labeled sperm. So you can actually track sperm head movement within the female reproductive tract. This in many ways really revolutionized the field of sperm competition. This is really the first time that people in real time could track the movement in the storage and ultimately fertilization patterns of competitive sperm from different males using differentially labeled sperm. So we know a lot about sperm migration and storage. 
We also know a lot about female post-mating responses. And so we know, and Mariana Wolfner's group in particular has done a lot of research on the way in which seminal fluid proteins induce post-mating responses in females. And we also know a tremendous amount about oogenesis, oocyte biology, and fertilization in Drosophila. So in many ways, Melanogaster is a great model organism for studying post-copulatory interactions. However, it's remarkable to me that even though Drosophila Melanogaster was like the model system for pushing forward tissue-specific transcriptome characterization. I mean, we knew more about tissue specificity of gene expression and sex bias gene expression in, Dros in Drosophila than we did in almost any other species. We really knew very little about gene expression profiles in the lower reproductive tract. So this is exactly what Caitlin set out to do. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly about two of her studies. The first one is looking at expression dynamics of the female reproductive tract. And so this is the first target analysis of the six tissues that comprise the female reproductive tract. And this compared time points in unmated females, six hours and 24 hours after mating. And you can see the names of the reproductive tissues here. The bursa, which is the first place where an ejaculate is transferred to, the seminal recept receptacle, which is the primary sperm storage organ, the spermatheca and the perovaria, which both have secretory capacity, and the oviduct. In the second study, following on for what I'm going to tell you about the sort of RNA-seq analysis of the female reproductive tract, the second thing that we did was look at the proteomic characterization of the female reproductive tract microenvironment. I'll tell you how we did that. In order to do that, it involved using a heavy labeling approach such that we could distinguish male and female derived proteins. So that's the one trick here, experimental trick that was used that's a little bit different from the standard proteomic analyses that we do. Okay, so to summarize the analysis of female reproductive tract expression, as I said, this was the first targeted approach of the six tissues that comprise the lower female reproductive tract might not sound complicated, but this involves dissecting a tremendous number of females. So hundreds of females or you know, pre precision micro dissection to separate the tissues pooled together for each replicate. So this was a very labor intensive experiment, even though at the end of the day, it is RNA-seq and very standard analytical approaches. So this is sort of a, a, a clustering map of gene expression across the six tissues unmated six hours after mating, 24 hours after mating. And I'm just gonna sort of summarize some of the main take home messages here. Obviously you can see immediately with very high and robust confidence that each tissue has a transcriptome profile that's distinguishable from the other tissues. Perhaps that's not so, so surprising. I might also point out that the major bifurcation on the tree separates those tissues that have secretory capacity. And we're going to come back to protein secretions in a moment. You can see that the perovaria and the spermatheca are separate from the bursa, the SR, and the oviduct. So right away, what we know now is that we have transcriptome profiles that are distinct and that the two primary tissues, which are known for having secretory capacity, cluster together separately from the other reproductive tissues. This is this uh, just shown in a principal component analysis. Again, you can see each cluster, the replicates of each cluster across the time course grouped together and that you can see clear separation of the secretory tissues. So one of the things we wanted to know, despite the fact that the tissues have really distinct transcriptional profiles, the question is after mating, do we in fact see sort of coordinated gene expression dynamics? And the answer to that question is yes. What this is showing you is pairwise correlations of gene expression changes. In the top half of the figure, you're seeing log twofold change from the unmated females to the first time point after mating. And in the bottom half of the experiment, you're seeing log twofold change from six hours to 24 hours. And so despite the fact that the tissues have distinct transcriptional profiles, the changes that they're undergoing in gene expression are correlated. So that's quite surprising. So there's some sort of mechanism by which correlated changes in the post-mating responses occur. So that also is surprising to us and it's surprisingly consistent. Not all of the correlations are, are, are super, super robust statistically, but nonetheless, this overall pattern was quite surprising to us. <clears throat> 
So one of the things we wanted to look at specifically had to do with the likelihood of different tissues being responsible for the production of proteins that ultimately would be secreted to the female reproductive tract microenvironment. So on the left-hand side here, what Caitlin did was, was um, assess the level of tissue specificity of each gene using the metric tau that some of you may be familiar with. So on the x-axis here, you, as you move to the right, higher levels of tau are associated with higher levels of tissue specificity within the female reproductive tract. And you can see that those genes that higher, have higher levels of tissue biased expression also tend to be expressing genes that have signal sec secretion signals. And so that immediately leads us into the next study, which is asking questions about what are the post-mating dynamics of the actual protein components that are present within the luminal extracellular microenvironment of the female reproductive tract. So this sort of an analysis, as I mentioned earlier, requires an approach by which you can very reproducibly distinguish between male and female derived proteins. One of the complexities here is we want to know what are the dynamics of the molecules found in the female reproductive tract, but we're not interested in picking up at, in this experiment those proteins that are coming from males as part of the ejaculate. Obviously, we know that there's going to be seminal fluid proteins and sperm proteins that are present that have been derived from males. And so the question is, how do you distinguish between male and female derived proteins? And in fact, this is not that hard to do in Drosophila to do whole fly labeling. What one simply does is one generates oxytrophic yeast strains. We're the first ones to have done this using a double oxytroph, which just ensures that the lev level of heavy labeling is more comprehensive across all of the triptych peptides that are being analyzed in the mass spec experiment. Historically, this is awful, oftentimes done just single with a single oxytrophic strain. So we use a double oxytrophic strain. So you grow up the yeast, they rely on the, on the amino acids you're providing them for lysine and arginine, which of course are, have a heavy label to them. And then those yeast, which are thoroughly labeled, then become the only food source that you're giving to the flies that you raise on, the, on media containing those yeast from an early stage of embryogenesis. And so after that, the experiment, in fact, is quite easy. Um, there we devised a technique that allowed us to isolate and purify the contents of the female microenvironment within the female reproductive tract. The unmated sample is straightforward. You just isolate the contents of the luminal, luminal space. In the, in, the, in the other part of the experiment, you take unlabeled females, mate them to heavy labeled males, repeat the purification, and because of the labeling approach, you're able to essentially set aside those labeled proteins that have been derived from males, allows you to focus specifically on female-derived proteins. Very briefly, a PCA which sort of shows you the totality of the patterns that are interesting here. Not surprisingly, principal component one, which captures a huge amount of the variation, is distinguishing between tissue and the proteomic composition of the fluid. That's not surprising. Obviously, the, the tissue sample here represents all of the tissues of the low, lower female reproductive tract, whereas the actual fluid proteome is much more restricted with regard to complexity. So that separation was sort of expected from the beginning. But what's really interesting and is captured on principal component two is that you don't see that much variation in the tissues from before and after mating relative to the, to the fluid sample where you see tremendous dynamic changes in proteome composition for those proteins present uh, in the female reproductive tract fluid in the microenvironment. This is shown here in different ways. We can just focus on panel B there at the bottom left. You can see again here, we're looking at log two fold change, unmated to mated, and you can see that there are as a much broader uh, distribution of changes in the fluid relative to the tissue. Okay, so in many ways, these studies were kind of critical to do because as I said at the beginning of the section, we just had very little information about gene expression in the lower female reproductive tract. We had almost no information about what proteins might be present in the female uh, luminal extracellular space of the female reproductive tract. So these studies and other studies that Caitlin conducted are sort of foundational for moving forward. And, they, and I think that that's gonna prove true for the rest of the field to the extent that they're interested in understanding what's going on in the post-copulatory post -copulatory environment. So moving on to the molecular life history of sperm. This work was driven forward by Emma Whittington, who was a graduate student in the lab, and Aaron McCullough, who was a postdoc in the lab. 
So I just want to return to this idea of molecular continuity of the sexes. So the physiologic, physiological, metabolic, and biochemical requirements of sperm may necessitate what we're referring to as this molecular handoff from males to females. And when one uh, in a species where there is sort of this prolonged interaction and prolonged component of sperm life history in the female reproductive tract, one might expect that there's going to be some level of molecular continuity between the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system that ensures that sperm can remain viable and functional and have the capacity for fertilization within the female reproductive tract. So with the sort of foundational studies that I just told you about, we were now ready to really tackle the changes to the proteomic, the molecular composition of sperm during its life history in the, mole in, in the female reproductive tract. For this experiment, what we did was we were comparing sperm proteome composition across different locations. So we began by purifying sperm from the male seminal vesicles, so that sperm that have completed the process of spermatogenesis but have yet to be um, combined with seminal fluid proteins and other proteins of the ejaculate. And so it's our sort of starting point for the molecular life history comparisons. Sperm were then purified from the bursa 30 minutes after mating. And so that's going to be sort of prior to sperm storage, but after transfer to the female reproductive tract. And then we're gonna do two time points after sperm storage. So two hours after mating, from of purifying sperm in the seminal receptacle. And then we did a long-term sperm storage time point, which was four days after mating, also for the seminal receptacle. Again, this is just showing you sort of the experimental design. Important to point out, we did this experiment um, in different, for different analyses, we did it using unlabeled flies, but for other analyses, again, it was important to use heavy labeled flies such that we could distinguish between male and female derived proteins, which will become, I think, evident in a moment. Also, just for the sake of, of, of being careful and adding in controls, we washed sperm samples that were purified from these different um, uh, sampling locations to differing degrees such that we could minimize and hopefully eliminate non-specific adventitious interactions. So really what we're trying to pick up is female proteins that may be associating with sperm in a robust specific fashion or potentially even being integrated within the sperm cell membrane or the sperm cell and try to avoid non-specific interactions. Okay, very briefly, so what did we find? So in order, given the sort of levels of co-expression of many proteins across multiple components of the reproductive tract, we have a lot of different colors here in this legend on the left-hand side. For the sake of the talk today, I'm just going to be focusing on those with a red asterisk. So there's going to be male-derived sperm proteins. As you're going to see, there are going to be what are referred to as dual-derived sperm proteins, for which there is evidence of coming from both sexes, male and female. SFP, seminal fluid proteins, and then those proteins which were uniquely derived and contributed by females. So if we look at sperm composition from the bursa, again, this is 30 minutes after transfer, so it's not long after sperm in the ejaculate have been, have been transferred to females. As we would expect, the vast majority of proteins are what we refer to as canonical sperm proteins, that is to say they're proteins that are being integrated in sperm during spermatogenesis and are solely male-derived. Okay, we see a lot of SFPs, it's exactly what we expected, and they overlap very well with characterized, previously characterized SFPs in the field. But what we're really surprised to see is a lot of female derived proteins, even at this very early time point. Okay, above and beyond that, you'll note that although there are a good number of uniquely derived female proteins, we also note that there is a lot of overlap with the sperm proteome. This is this sort of first indication that there may be this molecular continuity. It seems to us that what's going on here is that in fact, females are co contributing proteins, either replacing or topping up proteins that are already present in sperm as a product of spermatogenesis. So what we're looking at here now is just stacked bar charts that's showing the number of proteins in this different category across the different time points and isolation locations, the bursa, the SR2 day, the SR4 day, and we also have a sample from the sort of other sperm storage organ, which is the spermatheci. I just want to point out a couple of things here. 
The first is that the number of proteins that are male-derived sperm proteins stays fairly constant throughout. You'll note that SFPs are reduced in number after sperm actually move from the bursa into, the, into sperm storage. And so nobody really knew much about the distribution of SFPs within the female reproductive tract. It appears that very few of them actually accompany sperm into the SR. Most of them perhaps are actually interacting with female re uh, you know, receptors in the bursa. It could be that they're degraded, don't ultimately know what their fate is, but there's a fairly limited set of SFPs that are actually accompanying sperm. And we know that some SFPs are localized within the female reproductive tract through their interactions with sperm. So although a restricted set, it's not entirely surprising that some of these may be associated with sperm and therefore accompanying them into storage. You'll also note, although in terms of absolute numbers, that there's sort of an increase in the number of uniquely female-derived proteins, and you'll see that there's also a bit of variation in some, some evidence of increases in dual-derived proteins that are sperm proteins that are also being contributed by females. So when one actually looks, and this is just one of the abundance analyses we did, what we're looking at here is trying to look at proteins whose abundance is increasing from our samples that were isolated from the male and the seminal vesicle and are going up in abundance during storage to the four day storage time point. And what you can see is that there's a general correlation. Those proteins that are going up in abundance also tend to have a higher proportion of, of, of derived copies that are coming from females. So it does in fact seem that females, female contributed proteins, again, that we can identify as female contributed because of the whole fly labeling approach do seem to be contributing to protein abundance changes over time in, in storage. So and a surprising estimate is that four days, the labeling approach does give us a sort of back of the envelope estimate of the proportion of proteins that are female derived. And at four days, our estimate is that approximately 20% of proteins are in fact contributed by females. So obviously we have the sort of ingrained notion that sperm, uh, that sperm are intrinsically and unequivocally male cells. These sort of observations sort of begin to challenge that notion that in fact, during their life history, they are in fact the sort of the product of both sexes. And we sort of had a little bit of fun uh, in the publication of this manuscript by including this, what is a thought experiment by Plutarch, which is the, called the ship of Theseus, which was actually brought to our attention by my colleague's son. And he was like, well, you have a ship of Theseus problem on your hand. And so this is this metaphysical thought experiment that has to do with if you take a ship and sequentially replace one part after another, when is it no longer the original ship, but is in fact something entirely new? And so this is sort of analogous to the phenomenon we think we have here. The longer that sperm are stored in the female reproductive tract, the more females are contributing to them. And again, it sort of challenges this, challenges this notion of them being intrinsically and unequivocally male cells. So I'd like to sort of, sort of conclude this section by talking about these sort of complementary concepts, which I think hopefully provides us with a framework for future studies in other species. And it's this idea that the complementarity of this idea of the life history of the sperm proteome and intersexual molecular continuity, it really provides this sort of predictive framework for the diversity of reproductive biology across taxa. And what I mean by that is, is as the life history of sperm becomes prolonged and expands during evolution, we might have the prediction that genes contributing to spermiogenesis, sperm modification and sperm metabolism may shift from being male specific or male biased to being something that is shared between the sexes. And so for example, if we develop ants as a system where they have the really the sort of are the outliers end of the spectrum where sperm may be stored for years or even a decade, the question is, does that lead to testable hypotheses with regard to the evolution of sex biased expression? I wanted to point out for this group specifically, because I know you guys work on simulans a lot, that although I've been talking about work in melanogaster, really kind of you know, micro um, mechanistic processes in melanogaster, that we've been able to do all these experiments in the simulans and Morishiana speciation model system. So I don't think I need to tell any of you that Morishiana and simulans are very closely related, having diverged, I guess, about 250,000 years ago. We already know that there's reproductive isolation, and by that I mean specifically 
PMPZ, post-mating prezygotic reproductive isolation. And so really what this allows us to do is not only do conspecific crosses and repeat the experiments I've already told you about to look at the divergence of the processes in conspecific matings, but we can also do the heterospecific matings to look at how these mechanisms and processes may become dysregulated or quote unquote break down in a heterospecific cross. So Aaron McCullough, who is a postdoc in the lab, the first thing that we did in this system is we actually just look at FRT proteome dynamics. So again, what we're looking at here is how protein abundance changes, how protein expression changes in the female reproductive tract after mating. And in this case, what we did was do both conspecific matings and also the heterospecific mating where simulans females are mated to Morishiana, sorry, sorry, simulans females are mated to Morishiana males. And this is just to summarize it very briefly, obviously principal component one, as you can see, is separating the sort of conspecific um, mating. So you see divergence between the species. Unexpectedly, we have a kind of a big level of divergence, a surprising level of divergence. So principal component two is picking up a lot of variation in the female reproductive proteome between mated and unmated females in Morishiana and relatively little between unmated and mated simulants. Now, what that means exactly, we're not entirely sure at this point in time. Clearly, there's a lot of differences. The extent of protein differences is very different, but we can't rule out the fact that it may be due to temporal differences and when changes occur. Really, we need to repeat this experiment and do more time points. So there's something going on here. We ultimately don't know at the end of the day how much of it is a temporal shift in post mating dynamics, right, versus actual differences in protein expression levels. But in Melanogaster is much more pronounced. It's more. It's almost. It's almost exactly like Morishiana in the extent, in the magnitude, or ex the extent of variation as captured by a principal component analysis. So simulans seems to be the outlier. Spent a lot of time hypothesizing about why that might be. But I think at the end of the day, it really requires a more refined um, time series experiment to get at what's going on. But as you can see, the purple point in the bottom right-hand corner is immediately we are seeing differences in the heterospecific cross. So when simulans females are mated to Morishiana males, something about the extent or the timing of post-reproductive proteomic protein abundance changes is, is obviously different. So currently, we actually have proteomic data that is tracking the molecular life history of sperm from all of these crosses, and the work is underway. There is some preliminary data that also we can see that in the heterospecific cross that the modifications to sperm that I talked about in Melanogaster seem to be dysregulated relative to the two conspecific outcomes. So hopefully we'll have more to report on that soon. Okay. Okay, by way of conclusion, this isn't really so much a conclusion, but more of an introduction to some of the other work that's ongoing in the lab. What I've talked a lot about today is, is microevolutionary processes, and I haven't really told you much about macroevolutionary patterns. And so what I want to tell you about now is sort of the culmination of some big uh, projects that we've been working on for several years, quite a different brand and style of science. Um, as I've told you very much at the introduction of the talk that we know that in Drosophila, we have this sort of co-diversification of sperm morphology, sperm length, with seminal, re seminal receptacle, sperm storage length. And some of you probably will be aware of Scott Pitnick's original characterization of Drosophila bifurca. So along this continuum of sperm length evolution, which is highly variable across species, this is Drosophila bifurca, which produces essentially the longest sperm that we know of in the animal kingdom. What you're seeing here is that the length of the sperm is far greater than the male that has produced it. And the reason I'm telling you about this is not just to highlight the amazing sort of evolutionary variation, but the point here also is that this has tremendous trade-offs with other traits, okay? So Dros Drosophila bifurca males mature very slowly. They reach reproductive maturation very, very late. It takes them a long time to develop a testes, which is capable of actually producing sperm of this length. And also they produce very few gametes. They invest a lot in each individual gamete and have obviously there's a trade-off and have evolved to produce very few of them. This is just showing you correlated evolution. On the left hand is a female reproductive tract where you see a very short 
SR on the right is, is bifurca. We can see the seminal receptacle has co-diversified to accommodate this very long, long sperm. And I'm not suggesting the directionality of the change in the selection. I'm just simply saying that they're co-diversifying. But in fact, that's the entire point of the project I'm going to tell you about. This is, again, this is showing you co-diversification co across populations. This is showing you residual contrasts and SR length and sperm length across species, very tightly correlated. So the idea here with this project is to go above and beyond doing comparative phenomics of reproductive traits but to do really broad, broad scale phenomics of both reproductive traits and life history traits. This work really is being driven by Scott Pitnick and I, really being driven by Scott, but we wrote the grant together. The person who's really the mastermind behind the actual operation is Zishan Syed, who for the last five years, despite COVID, has been working with an army of undergraduates to do phenomics across a broad set of Drosophila species. Yasser Ahmed Brahma is also involved in the project. And the broad goal here is to char characterize reproductive and life history trade-offs through the analysis of multi-trait uh, covariation. So to do this project, we've teamed up with Patrick O'Grady, who's running the Drosophila Species Stock Center. RDM Cop has also been really important in contributing other species that we're interested in tackling. You're not going to expect it to read the list of phenotypes quickly, but I'm just going to point out that this is the set of 24 phenotypes that have been characterized. We have a variety of morphological traits, including reproductive morphology. You can see sperm morphometry is there, testes length, egg size, uh, SR, sperm receptacle length. We have some behavioral phenotypes. Um, and going down to the bottom, female remating interval, age-specific female fecundity, and lastly, and importantly, lifespan, sex-specific lifespan. And so as of just about a month ago, the phenotyping has been completed, and we've done it in 150 species. Again, this is largely Zishan and Scott's hard work with, again, as I said, despite the interruptions of COVID, uh, a, a large number of undergraduates who have contributed to this research project. But of course, you can't do an analysis like this unless you have a highly resolved phylogeny. And it just so happens that Dmitry Petrov, Bernard Kim, and Anton Savorov have been very generous. They have been, and many of you may know this, have been involved in establishing an extraordinarily ambitious genome sequencing pipeline and they have been very accommodating and excited to collaborate on this project and add our evolutionary phenomic species to their sequencing pipeline. So again, as of just a couple of months ago, we now have a highly resolved phylogeny in genome sequences for the 150 species for which we have phenotypes. They're going well beyond this. The 150 is kind of small in comparison to their ultimate goals. The gold ring on the outside shows you the species that have been targeted by phenomic analyses. And you can see other sequencing efforts that they're completing uh, in the other colors. And so the idea here is really to do broad scale phenomics and understand how reproductive traits co-vary the trade-offs between reproductive evolution and these other life history traits. For this audience, I also wanted to point out, I promised it was something that was going to go from microevolutionary processes to macroevolutionary patterns. And this is also going to be, for some of the phenotypes, integrated with GWAS studies using the DGRP. And so we've just finished getting uh, DGRP analyses for sperm length and SR length. This is just a Manhattan plot showing the significant loci for these two traits. And so the idea here is really to integrate intraspecific genetic architecture analyses for particular traits with broad scale evolutionary patterns. And I guess I'm just gonna conclude there, I'm out of time. If, if nothing else, I think it's a very exciting time for the field. I think the tools are there. We sort of have the foundational knowledge to really begin to focus on integrated studies of reproductive evolution that takes into consideration both males and females and importantly, the selective environment of the female reproductive tract. So briefly, acknowledgments. All of the postdoctoral researcher, researchers who've contributed to this work, in particular Zishan, who has led the evolutionary uh, uh, phenomics work over the last five years. Graduate students, Caitlin, I mentioned again for her foundation work on the female reproductive tract. I don't, she's not here, but she may be listening online. SU collaborators, and I'd like to point out Mariana Wolfner, Patrick, Dimitri, 
and the entire crew that's involved in the genome sequencing effort is just incredibly fortuitous and timely that they happen to be doing this ambitious genome sequencing at the exact same time when we're in desperate need of a phylogeny to begin our analyses on this sort of uh, evolutionary trait and, uh, work and all of the undergraduate researchers that have been involved in the phenomics work. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you have.